And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day, I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid, I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th anniversary of Aspen Ideas. And the warmest possible welcome to the North Wealth, North, I did practice so many times. <laughs> and the warmest possible welcome to the North Well Health Nurse Choir as well. Really amazing. <laughs> Want to hear one more song? Hit it again, Ben. <laughs> Christian. <laughs> Emmanuel. <laughs> Gael. <laughs> Janelle. <laughs> Jody. <laughs> Janelle. John L. <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> Julietta. <laughs> Tisha. <laughs> Shonda. I got it right. And Winnie. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, again, the Northwell Health Nurse Choir. Hit it.
I bet you all could skip my remarks and have a third song. But thank you so very much. I am Ruth Katz, Director of Aspen Ideas Health and Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Health Medicine Society program, and it is indeed my great privilege to officially open this year's event. I want to begin by acknowledging on behalf of the Aspen Institute that we are meeting here on sacred lands, lands that have historically belonged to the Ute Indian tribe, a native people whose culture remains vibrant today. We honor their legacy and that of all indigenous peoples and recognize their determination to sustain their traditions while creating opportunities for future generations to thrive. Now, while we're on the subject of determination, let me tell you just a little bit about the choir you just heard. At the height of the pandemic, these nurses came together online to share a musical message of hope and perseverance and to lift the spirits of remarkable frontline workers who were sacrificing so much to care for those stricken with COVID. Incredibly, they went on to the season finale of the hit TV show, America's Got Talent. <laughs> hey, they almost won. <laughs> Top 10, I watched it, I saw it. And since then, they have sung at the White House, Madison Square Garden, Carnegie Hall, and many other venues, and I think you can understand why. One more round of applause. <laughs> We are so honored to have them with us now. These music makers remind us that there is a remarkable cadre of caregivers in our health system, men and women from so many different backgrounds, all prepared to stand staunchly by their patients. In the toughest of times, they truly give us someone to lean on. The bonds that the Nurse Choir have established with one another also remind us that community really does matter. And that, I think, is an important message as we gather this week. We, too, have become a community, a group of people who care deeply about health and health care. The, uh, the connections we make and the opportunities we have to learn from one another inspire and support our work. If you have been at Aspen Ideas Health in the past, you know that a palpable spirit of inclusiveness and an openness to new ideas somehow envelops the campus during the three days that we spend together. If you are new to this event, rest assured, you too will fall under its spell. What some of you may not know is the enduring impact of what begins here. Aspen Ideas Health is so much more than an opportunity to bring together some of the planet's most accomplished thinkers and doers, although, of course, we've been doing that for 10 years now. It is also a venue where new ties are forged and moonshots moonshots suddenly appear within reach. It is a springboard for action, an opportunity to build coalitions and influence policy, an inspiration for novel research and the launch of new business ideas. Seeds of change are absolutely planted at Aspen Ideas Health and blossom in the years that follow. With that, let me briefly share with you what's in store. The 60 plus sessions on the offer are grouped by themes that reflect some of the most complex and intriguing scientific policy and ethical issues we face in the field of health. If there is a single message to emerge from the science of tomorrow's sessions, it is this. We will soon be able to accomplish much, much more in health and medicine than we can today. But future advances will require all in commitments to spare us from the threats to our galactic home and that's a caution explored in Planet Health. They will also demand strategic investments in technology and human capital, and under the healing economy, we look at how profits, social impact, and consumer preference are driving those investments. As well, we need systems, devices, and a built economy that is user-friendly and scaled for human beings in order to promote good health. That's what the power of design centers on. To move forward, the women who hold up half the sky must be fully engaged, and so we put a spotlight on women's health. Yeah. Drilling down to individual well-being, the sessions covered in the census enlighten us about how we perceive the world and offer tools for expanding those perceptions. And how to thrive considers what allows us to live well 
why close personal relationships matter and how to find meaning and purpose in our lives. Lastly, recognizing that there are so many interconnected ways to tackle the thorny problems that lie before us, Viewpoints introduces us to leaders, thinkers, and innovators who are really making things happen in health. I warn you, you're going to be really busy. <laughs> our generous underwriters make all this possible, and we owe them our thanks. We are excited to see so many returning supporters and to welcome several new ones. Check your program guide and make it a point to attend their sessions and visit their informative exhibits scattered throughout the campus. Thanks as well to NBC Universal, which is entering its second year as our media partner. Their journalists will be broadcasting highlights from Aspen Ideas Health to a public audience, bringing greater attention to the topics we are covering this year. A special nod to our fellows, all 102 of them. I actually had the privilege just about an hour ago of spending time with some of them earlier. They hail from eight countries, including and as well as 72 cities in 31 states. They are some of the smartest young leaders around. Please watch this group of rising stars because we'll be hearing a lot more from them in the coming years as they help to transform health and healthcare here and around the world. And of course, where would we be without all of you? Our patrons and our pass holders, you motiv us, mo motivate us to keep doing better every year. On this, our 10th time around, we hope you are as inspired by us as we are by all of you. Finally, let me remind all of you at this most divisive time in our nation's history, we remain a place where people can gather, engage in conversations, and truly listen to one another, even when we are talking about sensitive or controversial issues. Here we encourage debate and differences of opinion, but always, always insist that all voices be respected. Civil dialogue is the heart of what the Aspen Institute stands for, because we believe it offers the greatest hope for building on common ground. So, go forth with gusto. <laughs> Lots of gusto. Over the next few days, seek out topics that intrigue you, and then mix it up by attending a few sessions that take you somewhere entirely unfamiliar. Move out of your comfort zone and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Don't miss some of our special events. Check the schedule and join us for morning yoga, bird watching, art tours, a hike to the Maroon Bells, and book signings. And keep in mind that several downtown public sessions are scheduled during Aspen Ideas Health. We consider ourselves very much a part of the life of this town, and we want to share what we do with the people who live here. You are welcome to attend any of those sessions which are included in the program guide. And now, although I can't give you a third song at the moment, let me turn the microphone over to Natalie Johnson, Managing Director of Aspen Ideas Health. Natalie will be providing a few logistics and introducing our next session, but surely will be way too modest to tell you this gathering is absolutely unmanageable without her. As creative as she is determined, as knowledgeable as she is patient, especially with me, Natalie is truly the glue that binds Aspen Ideas Health together. Thank you again for coming. Happy 10th anniversary, Aspen Ideas Health. <laughs> Natalie, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Ruth, uh, for those kind words. Uh, the truth is that it takes a, a group of wildly smart, incredibly dedicated people behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, this is a group of people who work really hard and have a little fun as they shape something really meaningful. I'm referring to the Aspen Ideas Health team. Of course, we could not do this without our leader, Ruth Katz, who you just heard from. She has been the driving force behind this event since it began in 2014. Um, she is dedicated and persistent. She's knowledgeable and creative. It is her who inspires the rest of this team. Um, and I would like to take just one moment to recognize the team. So everyone is sitting right here. We have Deb Cunningham, Katie Taylor, Kathleen Shea, Aaron Phillips, Tanya Bauer, and Oscar Abello. Stand up. I 
I know many of you have had the pleasure of interacting with these incredible humans over the past several months. They have tirelessly thought about every last detail that goes into this event, and I'm truly honored to work alongside them. So thank you for recognizing them. Um, I also want to underscore what Ruth said about how honored we are to have every single one of you here with us to engage with each other, to learn, to share our ideas, our experiences, our hardships, and our hopes. The community that you will all collectively form over the next three days is what inspires us to keep doing this year after year. So as we launch Aspen Ideas Health 2023, I hope you'll challenge yourself, introduce yourself to someone new, and ask questions. So speaking of questions, I just want to take a few minutes to answer a few things now. Um, please know that we have over 200 staff and volunteers on campus who are here to answer anything you might think of over the next few days. Um, we want you to reach out to us, ask questions. Um, we really want you to get the most out of your experience, and we're here to help. So first things first, I want to be sure you all know to download the Aspen Ideas app. Oops, sorry. The app will give you the full access to the agenda, speaker list, maps, exhibit information, and more. Um, you don't have to log in, but if you do, you'll gain access to the Attendee Connect feature, which allows you to connect with each other through the app. If you have trouble, we do have a tech help desk in the registration pavilion, and they're there to help you get things downloaded or answer any questions. Um, the app will be continuously updated because, as you all know, things can change. It is a little tricky to get in and out of the Aspen Airport. We do our best, um, but things may change. So please check the app for the most updated version of the agenda. You'll also receive daily email updates in the morning that will include any schedule changes, so look out for those as well. Um, next, on transportation, we do have shuttles that run from both sides of campus into town. Um, they run on a loop. They run continuously from 7.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. We also have WeCycle bike stations that you can rent a bike for free for up to 30 minutes to ride into town. Um, and of course, it's a one-mile walk, and it's beautiful if you have the time to take a stroll. Um, as you all already know, we ask that you wear your badge at all times while you're on campus and when you attend events in town. Um, and last but certainly not least, food. It's important. <laughs> we'll have a light breakfast every morning from 8 to 10.30 offered on both sides of campus. And we have a lot of options for lunch, including at the Door Hosier Center, the Marble Garden Tent, and at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Tent in the Pepke Lawn. We'll also have food trucks, hot dogs are back, lots of snacks. Um, and please remember that we are at 8,000 feet. You cannot drink enough water here. Um, again, we're here to help, so please do not hesitate to ask any of us um, for assistance. And finally, we'd like to kick things off with a dose of inspiration. So we are about to hear from some brilliant minds. These are people who have been asked to share one big, bold idea with us. So without further delay, it is my very great pleasure to officially open Aspen Ideas Health with the 10 big ideas. Hi, I'm Marta Segura, the City of LA's Chief Heat and Climate Officer, the founding Chief Heat and Climate Officer, and my big idea is this. Our cities must align climate, equity, and health data and track it to implement informed strategies like we mean what we say about equity and climate. We fail the same communities over and over because we don't use equity and health-centered metrics to target for our climate investments and to examine our biased status quo approaches and get the results that we need. In Los Angeles, we're fixing this by using data to create resilient health zones and to focus our investments in pollution burdened areas that have the highest chronic illness, highest ER visits and deaths during heat waves and all climate hazards. These areas are called sacrifice zones because they feel they've been sacrificed because of historical disinvestment and redlining that has produced these excess chronic illnesses and lowered life expectancies and overall unintended consequences. So mapping and using climate equity and health data like we mean it means we implement these three strategies. One, in every major city, every department must be an equity focused climate department and must be funded to use climate, health, and equity data 
to be held accountable with transparent sharing of this data, such as with our city, our city's equity index. Two, cities everywhere must apply climate equity health data, such as the UCLA heat risk map and the city's equity index to create baselines, identify costs, and improve health and infrastructure while addressing the root causes of these disparities. This data will also show where to invest our climate solutions like green jobs, shade equity, resilience centers, hydration centers, just to name a few. Three, every city should replicate and improve this model with a whole of government approach, with the goal of resilient health zones. This will end these sacrifice zones and accelerate a livable climate for all. If cities can be held accountable by analyzing health, climate, and equity data and aligning it, we will have healthier, resilient communities nationwide. Thank you. Thank you for that brilliant comment. I've never been accused of that before, but I'm Troy Tazbaz. I'm with uh, FDA, and my big idea is to moving R&D dollars from cancer research from treatment to preventive screening as an alternative way to ca cure cancer or cancer deaths. Uh, I'm gonna, bear with me, I'm gonna cite some uh, statistics here. The US has about 60 mil uh, million patients living with cancer with another 1.6 to 1.7 million patients uh, getting diagnosed every year. It's projected to go up to about 2.3 million patients by, uh, or new cases by 2030. We spend about $50 billion a year in R&D uh, towards cancer curing treatments. Uh, according to NCI, we spend about $210 billion annually in uh, Medicare cost um, to cure cancer, and the out-of-pocket for uh, patients is around $21 billion. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, between 2000 and 2016, 92 novel cancer drugs were approved for 100 indications. Now, with all of that investment going, all of that innovation coming in, the average median overall survival has increased by only 2.4 months. That's two and a half months. So the big idea here is that we need to bring fo to, uh, focus towards development of lower cost preventive screening, measures that reduce friction and increase access to testing and include payer coverage. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jim O'Connell and I'm a, a physician and, a, and president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. And uh, I had an original big idea that I abandoned in favor of an idea that one of our homeless board members had. So I started uh, working full time with homeless people actually 38 years ago this month. And um, I left you know, the big academic world and um, came down to the shelters of Boston thinking I knew everything and learned I don't know where the nursing choir, but learned just about everything I know now from the nurses who had been there for a long time. But all, <laughs> so we are. But particularly from a group of feisty homeless people who made up a, the, peop, the people who made up the model for our program, in which they insisted, interestingly, on social justice and not charity. Uh, they wanted full-time doctors and not part-time ones, and they wanted us to be available 24-7. And then they want us to get out of our offices and go do clinics wherever they were, shelters, streets, soup kitchens, you name it. But we also had to stay part of the hospitals because when they got sick, they wanted their doctors and nurses to take care of them when in the hospital. And then the other thing they did was say, and when you discharge us from the hospital, darn it, set up a respite program, this is 1985, where we can go rather than be discharged to the streets and have to walk around after surgery and, and feeling ill. So we have 125, 24 beds now of basically step-down hospital, which is respite care, all coming from homeless people. The most, most dynamic, or I should say, one of the most dynamic homeless women on our board of directors, by the way, they also insist on being part of the governance of our program. And uh, she is a woman named Joanne, lived on the streets for 30 years, lived through hell, you know, you name it, awful violence, rape, you know, um, all sorts of um, injuries and assaults, trafficking. And um, she speaks now every year to the Harvard Medical students at the white coat ceremony, which is what, when you're coming to get oriented, they're there. And she speaks usually after someone who's done some amazing surgery and, you know, a three dynamic world. And she talks to the students um, brand new and tells them about her story, you know, having had her eyes stopped out. She suffers from terrible rheumatoid arthritis. Her, her hands are gnarled. She has pulmonary hypertension that really keeps her from breathing easily. And she has had AIDS for quite a long time. And she tells them about the, what 
it was like going into the hospital. So at the end of all that, she will look at them and say, just remember when you're in the hospital taking care of someone, it's me you're taking care of. And then the big idea she has, which I will say quietly, is she looks at them and she said, but above all, don't be a shithead doctor. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. My name is Katrina Spade and I'm the CEO of Recompose. My big idea is that our deaths can connect us back to the natural cycles and remind us that we are part of this big, beautiful planet. I know this is possible because I invented the practice of human composting and brought it to life. My company, Recompose, has led legislation in, in seven states and counting to allow human composting alongside cremation and burial. To date, we've composted over 300 people from all over the country. Composting humans is more environmentally friendly than cremation or burial, and I think it's the future. It works by mimicking nature's own processes. Imagine walking into a forest glen. Birds and branches overhead, pine needles, sticks and leaves underfoot. Imagine digging with your hands down about four inches. That rich topsoil is the result of natural decomposition as dead organic material creates new life. That same moment is what we're recreating at Recompose. But instead of sticks and leaves, we use straw and wood chips. And instead of the forest floor, our process happens inside of a Recompose vessel. In a matter of months, we've transformed a human body into nutrient-rich soil. So my team has begun talking about the next 30 years. Our audacious goal is for human composting to surpass cremation as the leading form of death care. This will result in millions of tons of carbon saved as we sequester carbon during the process right into the soil. And it will have a profound impact on us as humans as we connect our very last gesture to the health of the planet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Christopher McNeil. I am an emergency medicine physician and the founder and director of Youth Medical Mentorship. <laughs> my big idea is what if we could recruit black physicians like we do black athletes? Let me take you. Y'all gonna take my two minutes. <laughs> Let me take you to 2013, where Alabama head coach Nick Saban ends up sending 105 letters in one day to a high school senior, Alvin Kamara. It was a college world record in this, and he ends up being an NFL player. What if our medical schools could send one letter to a black child before they took the SAT or ACT with a statement saying, you got this, future doctor? In 2014, Syracuse University and their athletic department constructed mock Sports Illustrated covers. And those covers had their top recruits on them. So when they came onto campus and made the statement, if you come here, this is your reality. Imagine if our hospitals could go into a black neighborhood and put up a billboard of black staff, black alumni, heck, maybe even a black board member, and being able to say, with us, it's possible. By this time, we know the salaries of quarterbacks, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, but how many of us know the return on investment of a black physician in our own city? Because for every 10%, we increase our black physician workforce. Each black resident lives one month longer. As we are looking into evidence-based medicine, let's not forget evidence-based recruiting. And in this space, I ask you, mentor with us and recruit for all of us. Thank you.
My name is David Fagenbaum, and I'm a physician scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. My big idea is to create a world where every drug is utilized for each and every disease and every patient possible. I first learned about the untapped potential of existing drugs when I was a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania and I became critically ill with Castleman disease. My doctors explained to me that there were no more drugs in development, no more promising leads, and I was out of options. At that moment, I realized my only chance would be to identify an existing drug that could be repurposed for me. I tried that drug on myself from a different disease and it saved my life. I've now been in remission for over nine years and patients... <laughs> and patients all over the world are receiving that drug. Since then, my center has identified and advanced 15 more repurposed drugs for other diseases that they were not initially intended for, but there's still so much work that needs to be done. See, there are 3,000 FDA-approved drugs that are approved for 3,000 diseases, but there are 9,000 more diseases that don't have a single approved therapy. And though repurposing existing drugs for new uses is both faster and less expensive than new drug development, cures like my own sit on the pharmacy shelf for decades because of three systemic hurdles. First, there's no database that tracks the most promising repurposing opportunities. Second, companies are not incentivized to find new uses for existing drugs, especially the 90% of drugs that are already generic. And third, there's no organization responsible for ensuring that drugs are fully utilized for all the diseases that they can treat. Therefore, we spend tens of billions of dollars every year advancing new drugs and new development, despite the fact that these drugs do not have the ability to treat as many patients as the drugs that we already have in our pharmacy shelf. So today, I ask all of you to join us in this mission to repurpose drugs. We've recently launched an organization called Every Cure to make sure that drugs are fully utilized for all the diseases they can treat. So far, we've built an AI-powered platform that's been able to identify repurposing opportunities, and one of the most promising opportunities is the drug that we gave to a patient recently, and it saved his life. We are so excited to pursue more promising repurposing opportunities, drugs like metroleptin for anorexia, and basidinib for ALS, but we can't do it alone. Please join us on our mission by donating data and funds so that no patient is ever told we've tried everything when there's a life-saving cure on the pharmacy shelf. Thank you all so much. Hello, I'm Renee Weggerson, and I'm the inaugural director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H. My big idea is to make genetic alterations reversible and temporary. With the advent of gene editing technologies, we can introduce lifelong changes in patients that can cure disease or extend our most healthy state. But what if those gene edits are deleterious or they don't result in the desired end state? Reversible gene edits to allow us to explore potential solutions before or even instead of permanently altering a patient's genetic code. This would empower patients and doctors to make the best informed decisions for optimal safety and therapeutic effect. Given the diversity of human genetics, we know that people respond differently to any given drug, and it's going to be the same for gene therapies. For any gene, there's so many different sequences that can be considered healthy, making it difficult to select just one for gene replacement without predicting its effects. For diseases that are the result of multiple genes, like Alzheimer's disease, the combinations are endless. We're coming to understand that diseases like this are unlikely to be cured by a single drug or a single gene universally. Instead, we should approach these genetic conditions with personalized strategies similar to how we treat cancers. Think trying on new genes, like a pair of genes. But this isn't just about treating diseases. There are situations where an altered gene would be beneficial during specific life stages. Menopause modulators could provide relief without permanent changes. And later in life, temporary genes could greatly enhance natural abilities like preventing memory loss and gaining focus, or on a day like today, adapt to high altitude or jet lag. Perhaps most importantly, reversible gene edits bring additional patient safety, which means we can get cures to the clinic faster. Paired with ethical practices and responsible innovation, unlocking the potential of new genetic engineering technologies to support temporary gene changes will transform healthcare and human well being for the better. This exciting future is typical of the types of challenges ARPA H was designed to address. 
In the coming years, we intend to pursue many other challenges in health with the trademark APA audacity, rigor, urgency to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. Hello, my name is Dr. Chris Winter. I'm a non-shithead neurologist <laughs> and, sleep, and sleep specialist studying sleep for the last 30 years. I've written two books on sleep, host the podcast Sleep Unplugged, and have advised dozens of professional sports and military organizations about sleep and performance. My big idea is that we need to eliminate the phrase, can't sleep from our lives. It is physiologically impossible not to sleep. Sleep is as fundamental as ingesting, as ingesting nutrients, consuming hydration, and breathing air. The absence of sleep will kill you faster than the absence of food. This powerful language directs attention to a physiological state that does not exist. It obscures the real threat to our public's health. Virtually every media interview I've ever participated in was in some way addressing an inability to sleep. Some tips or tricks. Is sleeping naked the secret to falling asleep faster? Is having a plant in your bedroom the solution to your sleep woes? And don't get me started about melatonin. We have created an entire pharmaceutical and technological industry around this fear, and it comes at a great cost because it obscures the difference between insomnia and sleep deprivation, terms that are actually opposite. Insomnia is a subjective dissatisfaction with sleep. Insomnia patients often sleep as much or more than non-insomnia patients, with research showing insomnia patients often radically underestimate the amount of sleep they're getting by as much as 900%. Sleep deprivation, on the other hand, is an obstacle preventing an individual from getting the sleep they need to lead a healthy life. It is the sleep equivalent to starving. Sleep deprivation leads to not only overwhelming health problems and associated costs, but more importantly, an increased drive to sleep. And so what we were left with is an insomnia-laden media landscape that is making truly sleep-deprived people, like ones who fall asleep every time they sit down, think they are amazing sleepers, free from all the health consequences those poor souls who struggle to fall asleep have. They are the people at risk for mass massive health consequences. Falling asleep quickly is not a superpower. It is a warning sign that we as a health community must pay far more attention to. If we can do that and at the same time educate people that nobody can can't sleep, we will fundamentally transform public health. Free sleep advice all week. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Iman Abouzaid. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Incredible Health, the largest software-enabled career marketplace for healthcare workers in the US today. Uh, my big idea is we can stop the critical healthcare worker shortage in this country by simply taking the time to listen to healthcare workers. <laughs> the US, the healthcare sector in the US is the biggest labor sector in the country by number of workers. It's also the sector that has the biggest labor shortages. As our population ages, we're putting more and more demand on our healthcare system, and we as a country have not done a great job of increasing the number of healthcare workers and keeping healthcare workers in the workforce in order to meet that demand. Uh, my company, Incredible Health, has recently launched a study that shows that 94% of hospital executives describe their, the severity of their nursing shortage as critical. I'm focusing on nurses because they are the biggest group of healthcare workers in this country. So what do we do? What are we going to do about it? <laughs> so we need to listen. So first and foremost, let's look at what we know. We know that the processes, technology, and tools to hire nurses hasn't changed in over 20 years. We also know from nurses that this is what they want in order of priority. Number one, career advancement opportunities. Number two, they want flexible schedules. Number three, they want the opportunity to relocate. And number four, better perks and benefits. We also know that the health systems and hospitals that are offering and offering these and shaping their strategies to what nurses actually desire are hiring more nurses, retaining more nurses, and keeping more nurses happy. So, we all, it's, it, you know, one of the interesting things is very complex problems require very simple solutions, and this is one of them. All we need to do is listen. The nursing profession historically has been one that advances opportunity, it, it has built wealth, and of course is critical to, to delivering patient care, which is why we should all care about it. 
So all we need to do is listen and let's solve the critical healthcare worker shortage. Hello, beautiful people. I am Dr. Ebony Marcel. I am the director of midwifery at Community of Hope in Washington, D.C. It is a beautiful birth center that is attached to a federally qualified health center. I just got off the plane. I barely made it here. I, I promise I'm a lot cuter than I look right now in these travel clothes. Here's my big idea. <clears throat> expansion of black midwifery fellowships as part of the solution to address black maternal health. They need to be founded in black feminist thought, primarily only at sites that utilize a reproductive justice framework, focused on community-based care, allowing us to channel black midwifery, black granny midwifery, includes self-care. It also includes racism recovery, specifically focused on challenges around internalized racism, surviving in systems of oppression. It's built-in professional development and also entrepreneurial training. And very, very important, entry-level salaries. A lot of fellowships try to just give people half the money. Nobody needs half the money. Everybody needs all the money. <laughs> and... <laughs> One I'm taking from, like I always hear with residency, maintain education over service. Um, I feel like a lot of practices are strained and they end up having to use their fellows a lot more and while not training them the way that they need to be trained. And doing this, we will build a stronger, healthier, black midwifery workforce. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. And what a spectacular opening on a typically gorgeous Aspen evening. And even more gorgeous than the weather is looking around and seeing all of these people gathered together here, 8,000 feet in the sky, to put human health at the center of our thinking and our action. It makes a huge difference. Please join me in thanking our 10 big idea presenters for these marvelous ideas. I also would like to make a special thanks to David Fagenbaum, who is a graduate of Georgetown University, where I taught and had the experience of mentoring him. And it is an unbelievable pleasure to see someone you knew at that age, not only thriving, but leading, and in David's case, surviving, truly surviving, a life-threatening condition. And David, it's great to see you here. <laughs> now, I have a few other expressions of gratitude. First, of course, to Natalie Johnson, to the Aspen Ideas Health Team, to Elliot Gerson, and to the indefe indefatigable <laughs> Ruth Katz. Ruth, thank you. Also, please join me in thanking NBC Universal, our underwriters, our partners, our fellows, our army of volunteers, our speakers, our guests, our incredible board of trustees, and especially our dynamic new chair, Margo Prisker. Margo, thank you for being here. We have an incredible board of trustees who support us and make all of this possible. And while I can't thank all who are here today, I do want to commend three who will be speaking throughout this festival. Dr. Ken Davis from Mount Sinai is here. The Honorable Alex Azar, the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, is here. And an incredible innovator uh, and Ch Paragon Bi Biosciences Chairman and CEO Jeff Aronin is here speaking. So thank you to all of them. Now, not all of you know exactly where you are, I realize. The Aspen Institute came into the world in an age of post-war hope and institution building. When a group of thinkers and doers from civil society and the business world 
gathered here in the Colorado mountains to discuss nothing, nothing less than the future of humanity. They did so in the aftermath of war and genocide and nuclear devastation and the rise of the Soviet system with a shared belief in something called human dignity and a social order defined by freedom, justice, opportunity, learning, and democratic fellow feeling. From that 1949 convening right here, our ever-growing institution has pursued a bold purpose, which we formalized with our board of trustees led by Margot this year. And our purpose as an organization, our reason for being, is to ignite human potential, to build understanding, and create new possibilities for a better world. That is what this organization is about. And each year, Aspen Ideas Health embraces and reflects this noble purpose and expresses it anew. Today, in these tents, we ignite human potential by trying to understand all the factors that help or harm our well-being. Here, we build understanding among this high-level group of ethically attuned leaders, scholars, influencers, and innovators. Right here, at this time, we create together new possibilities for a better world by thinking together about what to focus on right now and then forging new partnerships to go out and do it. Across more than 60 sessions in these coming days, we will have the chance to go deep together on cutting edge topics that really matter. Like, for example, the maze-like legal landscape for reproductive health care. Like, for example, the emerging impacts worldwide of our changing climate on human health. Like, for example, the imperative to engage young people and vulnerable communities as experts in what they need and as assets this world can't move forward without. Like all of the new technologies and ways of thinking we just got a taste this evening that have vast potential to dramatically improve human health outcomes and with that, human dignity. We have the chance here to learn about and then go back home with ideas about breakthrough new research about how, for example, the senses can be a conduit to better health and well-being. We have a chance here to think through the urgency of reforming healthcare delivery systems for greater equity. And with that, and this is hard at the same time, dealing with the perennial American problem of runaway health costs. And with that, as we just heard on this stage, the growing need to reinvest in a generation of healthcare professionals who are stressed out, burned out, and uncertain about whether to stay in their fields. The great theme across all of these topics, of course, is change. Turbocharged, accelerating, disruptive, perhaps dizzying change for good and for ill. Sorting through the changes and challenges in our healthcare takes a community. We've tried to design this festival so that you as a community can learn together and then carry back home to your life-enhancing work a great wealth of new ideas and new partners and new coalitions and joy and friendship and hope. So thank you for being here. We hope that you have a great festival. We can't wait to see what you learn, what you share, and I hope all of you now will join us over in the Door Hosier building just across campus for a reception and a chance to get to know one another. Thank you all for being here.